A local study finds a Moderna booster shot is more effective against COVID-19 in older people. What do higher US interest rates mean for us in Singapore? We'll get an expert's view. And a powerful earthquake jolts Japan near Fukushima, causing havoc in homes. You're watching The Big Story. I'm Olivia Quay. You can subscribe to The Straits Times channel so you don't miss a single episode. A booster shot with the Moderna vaccine offered older people in Singapore better protection against COVID-19 if they had previously taken two doses of the Pfizer vaccine. That is the key finding from a study by the National Centre for Infectious Diseases. Researchers found that seven days after taking a Moderna booster shot, people above the age of 60 had an average antibody level, which was twice as high as those who took the Pfizer booster jab. In younger adults, antibody levels were similar between the two vaccines. NCID says the aim of the study is to build local data on understanding immunity towards the disease through boosters. The weekly infection growth rate here is still dropping to 0.76 yesterday and making it the 15th day in a row that the figure is below one. Now this comes as nearly 11,300 new infections were reported last night. The vast majority of the local cases are still mild with some 9,700 detected through ART. The other 1,400 or so were identified via PCR tests. There are 1238 COVID-19 patients in hospital as at noon yesterday, 36 in ICU and another 171 needing oxygen support. Overseas, despite logging a record of over 620,000 new cases and 429 deaths today, South Korea is still looking to end restrictions like the six-person limit on private gatherings and a quarantine for inbound vaccinated travellers. A decision on whether to ease further measures is expected as early as tomorrow. Meanwhile, China's new local symptomatic cases declined for a second straight day at 1,226 as a flare-up in the northeast grew at a slower pace. Although its current wave is considered tiny by global standards, national officials warn that virus control is becoming increasingly difficult with more than two dozen regions reporting infections recently. And as Shenzhen wraps up the last day of three rounds of mass testing for its residents, the technology hub will allow firms to resume work following the suspension of non-essential businesses. Singapore, South Korea and China are part of the body of nations identified by the World Health Organization as the current global COVID-19 hotspot overtaking Europe. WHO is voicing alarm that cases are soaring again around the world, despite testing levels dropping significantly. Following weeks of decline, reported cases rose globally by 8% last week, with more than 11 million cases and over 43,000 new deaths registered. The U.S. Federal Reserve's move to hike interest rates for the first time since 2018 is being closely watched around the world, including here in Singapore. Well, that's because rising rates will have wider implications, not just on American businesses and consumers. On Wednesday, the Fed lifted its key rate from near zero to a range of 0.25 to 0.5 percent to help fight inflation. The Fed flagged further increases coming at each of its remaining six meetings this year. With more is Selena Ling, Head of Treasury Research and Strategy at OCBC Bank. Selena, how much of an impact does the Fed's move have on Singapore's interest rates? Well, I think a more hawkish Fed in general would also mean that sing interest rates would follow the US interest rates higher over time, although it will not be a one-for-one -one type of correlation. But it is actually very interesting to note that, you know, the Fed has been lagging behind market expectations. 
So the futures market already had been pricing in the possibility of the Fed hiking seven times this year. So to a large extent, I think the Fed is playing catch up. So what we have seen in the overnight moves essentially is that US Treasury yields are sharply higher in the wake of the FOMC meeting. But if you look at the market action on the SING side, actually SGS bond yields are actually lower. I think to a certain extent, um, you know, market players are trying to anticipate what would be the response from the Monetary Authority of Singapore in light of the FOMC's latest interest rate trajectory. So as you know, the MAS actually slightly steepened the senior slope in October last year, and they did an off-cycle tightening in January this year. So there is another scheduled meeting coming up fairly shortly in early to mid April, which is less than a month away. And I think market is really trying to anticipate what would be the MES's next move, which is, of course, leading towards the possibility of another tightening move as well. Selena, I want to get you to elaborate on the MES's uh, possible response uh, later on. But first, you know, this latest move by the US Federal Reserve, it will no doubt affect business and consumer spending in the US. But what are the implications for demand for goods and services from Singapore? Well, I think if you look in terms of the market reaction, it tells you quite a fair bit about what has been already priced in. So higher interest rates from the Fed in light of the multi-year high in terms of US inflationary prints is quite clearly they are playing catch up. I think in terms of how it would actually impact the US economy, especially on the growth front. So Fed Chair Powell actually sounded hawkish, but also upbeat at the same time. He actually opined that, you know, this current Russia-Ukraine tensions would not have a very significant impact on US growth. Hence, the central bank is focusing more on combating inflation rather than trying to support growth. In terms of the impact on the Singapore economy and also in terms of demand uh, for both consumers and also business confidence, I think we have to look at it as a glass half full in the sense that we are seeing price inflation across a lot of goods and services rising quite sharply. Uh, some of it is due to, of course, uh, global supply chain problems. And some of it, of course, because of the disruptions that we see due to the fact uh, that, you know, uh, Russia and Ukraine are at odds with each other. I think going forward, we do expect that higher inflation is here to stay in the short term. And this would actually mean that the MAS would have also to stay on a hawkish path. So we don't think that this in itself should derail business confidence or consumer spending for that matter. But, you know, geopolitical uncertainties are typically very, very hard to predict. So we are a little bit, you know, careful about the potential downside risks if central banks, for instance, like the Fed, actually become overzealous and overdoes the monetary tightening. Well, Selena, let's go back to what you uh, earlier said about, you know, MAS's response. As you know, Singapore is also battling rising inflation. So what do you expect will come out of the Monetary Authority of Singapore's upcoming policy meeting in April? I think our baseline scenario really is that the MAS will continue to tighten for the third time running in the April uh, scheduled meeting. Of course, the form of the tightening and the magnitude of the tightening is actually fairly dependent on how the data, especially on the inflation front, pans out you know, in the coming weeks and months. But given that geopolitical uncertainties really have contributed to you know, commodity prices and food inflation running a little bit hotter than what was initially expected, I think the pressure actually is on for central banks, including the MES, to lean a bit more on the hawkish side. Of course, you know, uh, if they do steepen the slope for the senior uh, trade weighted basket uh, again, there is a possibility that they can do a little bit more in terms of the steepening compared to the last two tightening moves. And I think this in turn will actually help to suppress some of the imported inflation that's coming into the Singapore economy and also allow sink interest rates a little bit of breathing space so that they don't actually have to follow the US interest rates like for like. Thanks so much for sharing those perspectives, Selena. Selena Ling, OCBC Bank's Head of Treasury Research and Strategy.
In other news, you're seeing some of the aftermath of the magnitude 7.4 earthquake that struck Japan's Fukushima last night, leaving at least four people dead and around 100 injured. One resident recorded this in his home, furniture shaking vigorously, leaving his things all over the floor. And more than 250 kilometers away in Tokyo, our Japan correspondent also felt the tremors. I live on the 13th floor and my apartment swayed for at least five minutes whilst the power went out entirely for about two hours where I'm living at uh, in Minato Ward in Tokyo. So this is one of the largest quakes I have experienced since I moved to Tokyo about six years ago. And it's really the first time where I've encountered such a blackout where, you know, even the traffic lights and as well as the street lights were not working at all in my neighborhood. Still, I, I think uh, what I encountered is nothing thing as compared to those who live in northeast Japan where you know last night's jolt will be an unpleasant reminder of what happened 11 years ago this month on March 11 when a magnitude 9.0 earthquake triggered a major tsunami that caused meltdowns in the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. Um, thankfully though whilst uh, there were some reports that you know the coolant uh, pumps that are used to cool the spent nuclear fuel briefly stopped in you know two of the reactor units at Fukushima Daiichi uh, and the nearby Daini plants. These have been restored and there have not been any abnormalities in the radiation levels at the plant. Um, another thing to be thankful for is that there were no major casualties from last night's tremor. Uh, as of the latest told, at least four deaths and 97 likely injured by the latest tally. Uh, though. I must say that recovery might take some time. Um, there have been instances such as the Shinkansen bullet train having been derailed uh, as it was traveling between Fukushima and Sendai yesterday, as well as some parts of the expressway in Northeast Japan are still closed, having sustained major cracks. Russia's President Vladimir Putin has lashed out at pro-Western Russians, calling them scum and traitors who needed to be removed from society. In a speech to the nation, Mr. Putin signaled a new crackdown against his fellow countrymen and women who disagree with him on the war in Ukraine. He also made it clear that he sees Ukraine as only one battlefield in his wider conflict with the West. Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden has labelled his Russian counterpart a war criminal. It's the first time Mr. Biden has used that phrase to describe Mr. Putin. The UN Security Council is due to vote tomorrow on a, a Russian-drafted call for aid access and civilian protection in Ukraine. To be adopted, a resolution needs at least nine votes in favor and no vetoes by Russia, China, Britain, France or the US. But diplomats say the move will fail because most council members would likely abstain. The resolution is also unlikely to be adopted because it doesn't push for an end to the fighting or withdrawal of Russian troops. Neither does it address accountability or acknowledge Russia's invasion of Ukraine. If you haven't planned for anything this weekend yet, we've got a few ideas for you, including a new eatery that sells prawn noodles. But first, what about this? An exhibition at Gilman Barracks for fans of photography. And here to share more is arts correspondent Toman Lee. Toman Lee, give us a glimpse of what we'll see at this exhibition. Yeah, so this is an exciting exhibition of photographic prints by artist Lavender Chang. Um, you spoke of a glimpse, um, that's a very fitting way to describe it because it's titled A Glimpse of Radiance from Under. Um, what Chang has done is carry a camera with her on her journeys by bus and on foot, and she's taken these very beautiful, exquisite, long exposure shots of the city. So it seems very surreal, very otherworldly, and if you look at a prince, they almost look like they were painted. Um, and, and they're very layered because they were, they were long exposure shots. Um, she spoke to me about how she sees the act of creating these images as um, painting the visual strokes of the ambiance of these places she has visited um, on these journeys. Um, so I found this a very contemplative show and definitely worth a visit. Um, it's on till May the 7th at Faust Gallery at Gilman Barracks, the art enclave close to Alexandra Road. So head down if you have time. And there are lots of other galleries in the area. So we could swing by and catch some of the other shows that are on at the moment. Well, thanks very much. That was arts correspondent Owen Lee.
After eating his way through Singapore's East and ST's Food in the Hood series, senior food correspondent Wong Ayok is back and he has a new food pick for us today. So Ayok, tell us all about these prawn noodles. Okay, this is a new prawn noodle store uh, in Sambawang. It's called Felofa. Felofa is, is a Cantonese name and it's the nickname of the founder, uh, Mr. Teking Hua. But people who have eaten uh, who have been to Sambawang before and eaten at the Sambawang uh, original white bihun may remember this prawn noodles because uh, Mr. Tay used to run a little store in his uh, white uh, bihun eatery and it was called Sambawang prawn noodles. But three years ago, he closed it down because his son took over the business and he expanded it and rebranded it as white restaurant. But now the white restaurant is like sort of stabilized uh, his Mr. Tay's children has decided that it's time to bring back the prawn noodle. So that is the background of Felofa. And this time they've made it a bit more deluxe because you get different versions. Uh, and the most expensive one is called the Signature Felo Noodle. It costs $20, but it comes with abalone, which uh, they didn't have before. So you have abalone, you have jumbo prawns, you have braised pork ribs. And you can choose whether you want it in soup or dry. I mean, it's really luxurious, um, $20 for prawn noodles, but it's good. Uh, but for people who don't want to pay so much, uh, like myself, actually, I, I don't really need abalone in my prawn noodles. So I would pick the $16 version, which comes with just the big prawns and the braised pork rib uh, together with the noodles. And I, I think that's good enough for me. Uh, what I really like about this prawn noodles is that the broth is so rich. Uh, it's really tasty. That, that's because they simmer the prawn paste and the pork bones for uh, up to 10 hours. So uh, you get really, really flavorful soup. Uh, besides prawn noodles, the shop also sells uh, something that they created called prawn zuki. It's based on this Japanese dish called ochazuki, where you have like uh, uh, rice, crispy rice and uh, seafood and then they serve it with either uh, matcha or dashi but in uh, Felofa because they do prawn noodles so they, they use the prawn noodle broth which is very good too I mean you add the prawn noodle to rice so instead of noodle you get rice uh, soupy prawn broth uh, together with the big prawns so it's a very wonderful dish as well uh, but personally, I would go for the prawn noodles because I love prawn noodles. Sounds positively yummy. Thanks so much to senior food correspondent Wong Ayok. I haven't had time to catch this one yet, but the reviews are quite mixed for Pixar's new film, Turning Red, now showing on Disney+. Plus. Let's get Jan Lee's take on it. So Jan, the film is about more than Asian representation, isn't it? Yes, um, actually, I would say the film is very much, uh, it's not so much like, a, oh, a Chinese or an Asian film. It is about a Chinese Canadian girl set in 2002. It's about her being 13 and becoming, you know, puberty. So actually, it is a coming of age film more than anything else. It's just that it's set in a very specific era. It's set in 2002, a Chinese Canadian girl living in Toronto. And when she, she gets upset, um, this is where the sort of magical, fant fantastical part of it comes in. When she she realizes that when she gets upset and when she goes through like big emotions like anger, embarrassment, sadness, she turns into a big red panda. And that's what she has to deal with la, throughout the film and, you know, um, and trying to overcome uh, her mother's very overprotectiveness, trying to overcome her mother's interference in her life and becoming her own person. All of that, you know, is talked about in the film. So it's very, very much a coming of age film more than anything else. And um, I personally very much enjoyed it. I know it's a Pixar film. Its target audience would be tween girls and family families, but um, I actually very much enjoyed it myself because I saw a lot of um, myself in the main character, Mei Lin. Uh, it's a very specific character. So she is a big fan girl, and I'm also a big fan girl. So she loves this boy band in the series called, in, in a movie called Four Town, which, by the way, I really have to shout out the music that um, the movie gives to Four Town, which is, if I'm not wrong, created by Billie Eilish and her brother, fin uh, Phineas. So um, it's 
very, it sounds exactly like music you would expect from a boy band in 2002. And it's very, very catchy. She draws fan art for her idols and it, it's very much like, yes, this is fan fangirls at 13. This is exactly what they would do. So I actually related to that very, very much. And as you mentioned, some of the reviews are mixed. Uh, I've read some of the reviews and I think some people have issue with the fact that it portrays... Um, a girl going through puberty and there's some mention of uh, young women getting their periods and some parents maybe find that a bit hard to discuss with their children but um i think it's fine like young women do get periods and you know kids as young as 10 or 11 might be dealing with something like this so it, i don't think it's an issue at all you know well turning red ticking all the boxes for the straits times is journalist jan lee we have more live picks for you online, including film correspondent John Louis' Academy Awards preview, who will win and should win at the Oscars. You'll find his piece at str.sg forward slash life. Visit straightstimes.com for more news and our YouTube channel for more videos. Subscribe by hitting the red button below. I'm Olivia Quay. Thanks for watching The Big Story and I'll see you tomorrow.